Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another exciting episode of the Vinny Eastwood Show, broadcasting live from the fabulously Fukushima irradiated, fluoridated, fascinatingly fracked up country of New Zealand in the sunny slave South Pacific, where the hole in the ozone layer makes everybody get a part time job as an incandescent light bulb. And my very special guest is the man with the answers. It's Anseri, Alex Anseri, that is. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Vinny. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you're here too. Are you like in a parking lot at McDonald's or something like that, broadcasting emergency style? <laughs> we'll talk a little bit about my last year's adventure shortly, but now it's better than that, Vinny. I'm actually staying at a friend's house, um, and uh, I'm looking forward to, for the first time in a long time, doing my show outside the box this Saturday again on American Freedom Radio, at least for a few weeks. Oh. So for the moment, things are a lot better than they were. Yeah, you've, you've been kind of like a, a, a bouncing around, sort of like a, a, a hacky sack on the, uh, on the American back trail there. It's true, and, and I've been trying to stay somewhat regular with my YouTube channel, but just to give you know a brief overview for, for listeners that, that, that are new to my work and, and what I've been doing lately... Um, I did access television for about six to seven years in Portland, Oregon, where I was doing a lot of what you're doing, but not on a daily basis, a weekly basis. And I was honored at that time to be able to introduce ideas about the New World Order and this freedom movement to people that had never heard of, of such a thing uh, outside of the media promoting the left-right paradigm. And, uh, you know, Vinny, I chose to free myself from myself beginning several years ago. You know, th this constant fear of living without money, it, it haunted me. Like it haunts a lot of us that are trying to do good work, but we don't want to live inside the system. So I decided that I would move to Texas. And I was there for about a year trying to help a, a company launch an alternative media network. And when that failed to move into fruition, I then uh, moved, went off grid completely and went in the middle of the desert in South Colorado. And I'm still in rural Colorado, and uh, I've been trying to see what the rest of America lives like outside of what I read on, uh, you know, blacklistsandnews.com or, or, you know, things I hear about on uh, AmericanFreedomRadio.com's podcasts and shows. I set out with very little money and followed the synchronistic clues, as Freeman talks quite often about, uh, in this journey to find out what it's really like to try to do it, not just talk about it. And that's still something that I'm trying to figure out how to do, how to be free, how to be free literally, not just uh, talk about being free. Have you noticed that whenever you desperately need something, it just kind of turns up precisely when you need it, not before and not after? Exactly. And I, and I found specifically that I will receive what I need, not what I want. And I'll sit there and try to argue, you know, and apply the law of attraction and, and say, no, I want Internet now. You know, I want truth or friends and allies now. I don't want things to be this hard. And then I go through that hardship, whether I like it or not, and find myself a different person, a stronger person, having survived what some people thought w was going to break me. Uh, so there's been many times where my car has broken down. I've had very little money or funds, um, sometimes no spare tire. And many times out in the middle of the desert, there has been someone that has come by to help me. So yeah, these are things that you learn along the way. Yeah, it's kind of like a, having faith in a, in a way. Having faith in, in, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous. These groups are well known for having this idea of a higher power and it not being a religious one. But we can apply that type of thinking that alcoholics and drug addicts use to conspiracy research. And we too can come up with a, an understanding of a power greater than ourselves or our own ego, that, that this source this this oneness that we're all connected to i feel we have responsibility to do that and do it outside of a religious box and some that's pretty much why i made my show some outside might argue, the box a long time ago some might argue alex that there's not a whole lot of difference between a conspiracy theorist and a drug addict or an alcoholic well i'll tell you what it, it is very easy to become addicted to certain information and i think that there is a very fine line between being spiritually fit and being mentally ill and as you talked about in detail on your show, you know, counseling for truthers, which I've shared with a lot of my friends because it's funny and it's very real. Unless one makes an honest attempt to be spiritually fit, to live a moral life, 
this information that we deal with every day can F you up to a point to where your mother won't even recognize you or you won't even recognize your mother. <laughs> this stuff has the power, if you're not spiritually fit, to take you away from the faith, to take you away from seeing where there are forces of good working through us and around us. Yeah, I, I do believe that that's a, uh, an absolute case. And it's like, once you stop thinking to yourself, you know what, I need this and I need that and I need the other. Once you realize, hey, hold on a second. Is it me deciding that I wanted those things? Or is it somebody else decided that I wanted those things? It, it, am, I, am I actually happier and a better man now that I have this new flashy fandangled cell phone or this uh, this car that I don't actually own and the bank re really owns? Am I happier now that I'm in massive amounts of debt? Am I happier now that I'm paying kind of like almost more than I can afford for my rent at the moment? Yeah, yeah I'm kind of not. Yeah, that, and that all deals with self-honesty, and that's, that's, respo that's responsibility, self-responsibility. And, and in some way, shape, or form, we have to work to continue to be self-honest with ourselves in the same way that someone um, that is working to become a better meditator, to become more aware for those that have done Vipassana meditation uh, and other forms of Buddhist meditations. The goal is to become very aware and very equanimous to what you're feeling and not overreact, to keep that reactive mind under control and in check. Well, there's a Buddhist saying that is to see things as they are. Um, and we also, you know, from those that have read Krishna's information, you know, to see reality as it is, not as we want to see it. Well, the same thing goes for keeping ourselves in check and taking a look at our own spiritual hygiene. And, and there are things that I don't like to look about uh, at in terms of myself and the world at times because it's upsetting. But that's also another reason why I went out into the desert, into the silence, because in the silence and you're not, you know, if you're not on Facebook every day, seeing everybody else's reality, then there's no one for you to blame for anything. Mm -hmm. You're just there in your own mental space. And I don't think it's healthy to just go out in the desert and stay there. But hell, I think everyone that truly seeks freedom should try a few months in the middle of nowhere and just, just be in your own thoughts. And being in a space where you can't blame anyone for absolutely everything, anything whatsoever. Mm. And, and uh, yeah. And it helps to take along a horse with no name. That's right. <laughs> that, that's, that's definitely true. And, uh, yeah, it's, there, there's something about, um, I, I think I've identified it as being, becoming more allergic to the city, you know, in my, in my travels from the last few years. I feel more allergic to these uh, arconic um, dense population centers. And um, Dallas was the last straw for me. Living in Dallas, Texas, this is like, for anyone that's seen the movie They Live, if you want to think of a city other than New York and Los Angeles as a great city for, for that movie to be set, Dallas, Texas is it. Could you elaborate? Because I've never been to Dallas. Well, um, so I'm coming out of a situation where I, I leave my six to seven years uh, of doing a show on the same channel at the same time. They moved me around once, and that screwed things up for me. But uh, the point is uh, family. I developed a sense of family there in my hometown. And things were very tough, tough for me economically. I couldn't afford to live anywhere. It seemed that there was no space for someone like me to, to get shelter at for more than a few days. And that hurt a lot. So I'm like, okay, wait a minute. Maybe I need to start thinking more globally about my message and about my audience. And by the way, when, when donations have come in, when I've needed it, most of the time they've been from someone that's seen my YouTube channel or listened to my show on American Freedom Radio or someone that knows me off of Facebook. I started to see more help coming from places outside of my own hometown. And I had to really grow spiritually to take that jump and go somewhere that was not a very spiritual place or a place where I felt at home, a place like Dallas, Texas. I'll talk about why I went there in a minute. But in, in Buddhism, there's, there's um, and I'm not a Buddhist, but you know, I'm using some of these ideas as, as memes for things I've been experiencing as I've been looking for towards greater self-awareness and growth. The practice of the Buddhist mandala of creating a work of art with sand creating something so magnificent and then blowing it away and starting again. That is how I would describe my leaving Portland at the age of uh, 31 
basically starting over and having such faith in myself that I'll create again and my ego doesn't have to be attached to what I already created. I'll just do it again somewhere else. So someone invited me to Dallas and they paid me every week. It was actually the best paying job I've ever had to help this person create their own alternative media network. However, I was not the manager, nor was I the shot caller. And so for reasons beyond my control, the funding after a year was no longer there to launch this network. Um, and I was very much in disagreement with the CEO of this would-be alternative media network as to the cost. I wanted something that was free or, you know, within $5 per month for people to have access to a network that would run alternative media content 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Essentially, not only was I set up to do a daily half hour show, but I was program director and I was picking out some of your best shows and some of the best shows of Freeman and others for this real network that people could access on Roku. So to make a long story short, I went there on a leap of faith. And that faith was that I was moving in a more positive direction because I was letting go of my own ego, letting go of, of, of stability, of, sp of speaking, preaching, at times crying, literally, for people to wake up in my hometown because I, I wanted to keep it local, Vincent. I'm like, okay, you can't fix the whole world. You can't be Alex Jones. You certainly can't be Superman. So you got to make it local. And I thought that was the lesson for me in you know, 2006, 7, 8, 9 as I was coming up. And then I had a shift of awareness again right as Occupy was kicking off. And since then, I'm thinking more about the global audience and, and everyone everywhere and not just small geographic areas. But in a nutshell, that's what led to me leaving Portland and what I built up and why I went to Dallas. And ultimately, I feel like it was all meant to happen for a reason because for years on my show, I started to have more people on that were talking about living off the grid. People like Matthew Stein, when disaster strikes, uh, rather when technology fails, and other related books. Some dealing with uh, primitive wilderness survival. Some just dealing with food storage and underground shelters and, and actually helping open a survival store called the Portland Preparedness Center before I left Portland, Oregon. So, again, I wanted to live something more genuine and actually not be in a situation where I was asking for financial help from the audience and I didn't really want to be in Portland anywhere. I wanted to see the world. So all these steps and the intention that I put out there to live an off-the-grid lifestyle, it all led to me eventually being here, getting to where I am now. Have you traveled overseas yet, gone to different countries? I'm not, but um, my, my experience as a truther has been unique because as far as I can tell, I'm the only person whose father is from Afghanistan that that's in the truth movement. I, I keep looking for other people and i'm very baffled that in a world of of how many people are on the planet now vincent seven, seven billion? billion yeah are, are we almost to eight billion I, I i'm trying to figure out what the the powers that be the the divine ones have for me and why i am the only one that feels called to present an assortment of truth about not only spiritual awareness who we really are but the new world order i'm trying to understand what my true mission is and i don't think i've I've done 10% of what I need to do in this lifetime. Well, you, you were but saying I'm earlier. I'm constantly asking myself, where are the other Afghanis or Iraqis? Why have I been disowned by both sides of my family, the white side and the Afghani side, because of the content on my YouTube channel and my show on American Freedom Radio? So it's a, it's a mystery I'm constantly asking. I think now I, now I understand a lot why you like that Counseling for Truthers video because I speak uh, extensively about relationships with your family in there and how uh, coming out for the truth actually puts a lot of pressure on. Um, now, you talked earlier about uh, how you wanted to focus local and then you decided to go global. Um, I started off doing doing the same thing. Like I started off kind of uh, listening to all the international talk radio show hosts and, uh, and uh, having the news and New World Order, the documentaries and so on and so forth. And then I noticed that there was nobody doing some, anything comparable in New Zealand. So I started going off and doing it in New Zealand. And then after I started interviewing activists and, uh, and people in this country, what I noticed is they're parroting almost the exact same thing that I saw was going on overseas. And it's like, whoa, whoa, whoa hold on a second. There's not a whole lot of difference between local and global anymore because we live in a globalist society. That's very true, and, and you are one in five million. And uh, why you're the only one in New Zealand that's talking about some of these things is also very interesting. You know, a friend of mine asked me about an hour ago, uh, who hasn't listened to your stuff yet,